Mark, something occurred to me as I was taking a shower last night, and I was thinking about this podcast we're going to record today and the fact that it will eventually be listened to by some people out there. I do have a feeling we have some listeners, at least. We haven't been doing this all for not I think at least long. seven. Did we count seven? Yeah, like one for every day of the week. <laughs> so I thought about this, and it was like I was standing there, and I, I kind of thought, our podcast that we've been recording, mm-hmm. they're they're out there, right? They're like they're like in the air. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like like sometimes when you sit there, I almost like feel like I need to swap them away because at any point in time I can pull out my phone and start listening to a podcast, but my phone isn't connected to anything. It's just it's just there. Right. So there's like podcasts in the air. They're everywhere. Yeah. And it's like like bugs. They're attacking. You can just you can just bing there's also YouTube videos and it's crazy. At any point in time. At any point in time. It's just kind of like, oh, yep, right there. Boop. And then a podcast comes from the air somewhere. From Vortex. Materializes and inside my phone and it, bam, and it plays. Complete enlightenment. Sometimes it's my incredible. phone even talks to a co- my car without being connected to the car. And then the car, and then it's, it's traveling, it's sending podcasts through my... Uh, uh, yeah, my actually, i got to probably ask you some technology questions with that, Jim, because I can't get my phone to connect to my car. <laughs> uh, as as uh, as to be expected. So, um, anyway, that little thought for you out there, if there's any tech tech wizards out there that want to tell us about all these podcasts that are floating around us right now, please do. Uh, with that said, we have a guest on with us who is arguably one of the most brilliant people I think that I've ever met. Uh, his wow. name is Mike. Mike, we're going to allow him to introduce himself, but I want to make sure that, you know, I, I don't know what his introduction is or if he's, or if he's planned it out, but I want to make sure that Mike doesn't do the whole kind of like, uh, doesn't go too humble on us here because Mike, Mike is an impressive person. Mike's a collector of binoculars. You, you could say he has, he has more binoculars than anybody I know. Uh, he, Knows more about birds and a lot of other things, probably, than insects. anybody. Insects, yes, and, and insects, really. Yes, sir. Yeah. Than anybody really I've ever met. Um, and I can't remember what the other thing was. Oh, didn't you used to do like you did like astronomy back in the day too? Astronomy and astrophotography. Yeah, and uh, really good digiscoper. And he's been with this overall entity company uh, for how long? 30 years if you count me as a customer of Eagle Optics prior wow. Wow. to my employment with Eagle. That is awesome. Yeah. And you've seen plenty of changes. And one thing that I hope you do get into when you introduce yourself is, is that, as you mentioned, when you were a customer and then working for uh, us with Eagle Optics and everything, big time into birding and, like you mentioned, some of the other uh, astronomy and things like that. And you know now, being with Vortex... You've begun your entry into the shooting world as well, so that's pretty cool. Which is very interesting, I think, as someone with my background. um, I've always had an interest since we got into it um, in 2002 when Vortex first started, and then um, really got more on the scene in 2005 and 2007. I was so engaged with Eagle Optics that I just didn't have much opportunity to get Mm -hmm. more involved in, in our rifle scope side of things, but... Since we um, disbanded Eagle Optics a couple years ago, I've had a lot more time and opportunities to take up what I think is so far the most enjoying aspect uh, of rifle scopes is long distance uh, precision uh, yeah. shooting. So that's it's very fitting. I remember when we when I heard that you were getting you know you're getting a rifle built or something like that. I remember thinking to myself, this is something that Mike's gonna all of a sudden just like little do we know just. We're going to be hanging out, and one day we're going to realize Mike is the smartest precision shooter and just, like, most amazing precision shooter Not in yet. the building. <laughs> Not yet, but it's going yeah. to happen. It's just going to be like one day we're going to wake up and be like, oh, my gosh, Mike is the go-to person for precision long-range shooting. As I've gotten to know Mike over the years, the one thing that I feel like I've come to grasp is he both feeds things. Like, if Mike gets into something, like, he gets into it. Like, mm-hmm. you're talking about astronomy, birding, like... To the nth degree, and I feel like you're on your path there to long-range shooting, and I also feel we were talking about, we had a little bit of Star Wars talk here, pre-podcast. Oh my gosh. And I feel like we've brought, not necessarily from the dark side, but we brought Mike from the dark <laughs> into, into the light, because big fans of all our birders out there too. 
we almost got him to agree. Actually, I'm sure he would have agreed, but then we were like, well, you might scare some people uh, to do the entire podcast in a Star yeah. Wars well, I think Yeah, I think um, kind of the, the thing that bridges all of those interests together is my love of just optics. Mm-hmm. I got my first astronomical telescope when I was 10 years old. I was, I, uh, my grandfather gave me his telescope um, before he passed away, and I still have it today. Um, he used to use it in Nebraska when he was a farmer just for ranching and stuff so he could uh, have a, an optic to see things far away. Um, so optics have just always fascinated me since as a, as a little kid. And my first venue into using optics, a telescope, was astronomy. And I'd always been into astronomy, even through high school. We had an astronomy club, and I never got to be president of it, but I was vice president. It was more fun anyway Politics. to be the vice president because you could goof around more. Oh, right, yeah, right. didn't have to take it so seriously. Um, and we went on field trips. We had a planetarium at our high school. So I had a, a long career, a personal interest in astronomy, and that's why I got involved with Eagle Optics in the first place as being oh, a, that was a, regu- what brought you in. A, yeah, a regular customer when um, your dad decided to bring uh, astronomical optics into the store. Um, he had Tom and Jody. I don't know if you remember those. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jody uh, were really into amateur astronomy, and we had, in Madison anyway, there was a, uh, an astronomy club, Madison Astronomical Society, which I was a member of. And so it all kind of connected up, um, and I bought my first serious astronomical telescope from Wild Birds Unlimited before there was actually like an Eagle Optics. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that goes back to the that? 92, 93. Yeah, that sounds in that about range. right. Yeah. I wasn't even here. Yeah, right. And, um, and then that interest developed into astrophotography and photography in general. And I took that, uh, no pun intended, as far out into space as I could by doing <laughs> photography of galaxies and star clusters and nebula that are you know, millions of light years away. Um, so that really honed my skills for optics. And then when, I, uh, when we ditched astronomy, um, after I came on in 2000, I can't remember how long we kept in with that. Unfortunately, kind of difficult to sell gigantic space viewing telescopes. Yeah, yeah. We tried it for a while. We but, did. Yeah. yeah, we gave it our best shot. Um, but then we, we kind of redirected towards the birding market. We were doing that, but we just I think we just put all of our efforts in that initially. Right. And that's where I became, I was already interested in, in just doing anything outdoorsy with optics, but I became more of a serious birder, keeping a life list, going birding as often as I could. And and that w- that led to um, uh, a kind of a celebrity status uh, for the state of Wisconsin. I won a few awards and for educating the public in the science of ornithology. And I took that, as Mark pointed out, both feet in, took it as far as I cared to, as far as I wanted to. And then uh, when Eagle Optics um, dissolved, then, well, I still love optics. Mm -hmm. I still want to use optics. We still do binoculars and spotting scopes and other things. But now it's time. This is my opportunity to get into rifle scopes. Pretty cool. So that's where I'm at now. That's awesome. That's awesome. It it is truly impressive. How many species of birds are out there? Worldwide, about 10,000. And I feel like... At any given point in time, we could be walking anywhere on the earth, and I could be like, "Hey, Mike, what's that?" And boom, within like a millisecond, he tell me. What oh, I do it all the time. I'm like, "Hey, Mike, I saw this thing. It had a little bit of black on its wing," and he's like, "Blah blah, blah. yeah, black out. activity." Yeah, and I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> go. Let me look in a book. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy. Yeah, that's the guy. How many? So you said how many? How many birds total? Uh, ten thousand worldwide. About nine hundred in North America. Of those nine hundred, I have about five hundred and fifty. That was my that question. you've seen. Yeah. That you, yep. Okay. Three hundred some in Wisconsin. I think I'm three twenty three in Wisconsin. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Anything that's just yeah. rarest bird I have for the state of Wisconsin is uh, a fork tailed flycatcher, which is from French Guiana. Um, okay. Yeah, it just got off course and ended up at Patrick's Mar- Marsh over by Sun Prairie. Just kind of a birder around. found it, reported it. Of course, no one initially believed the person, but then he, someone got pictures of it. Like, yeah, it's really there. So it was me and Marty. You remember Marty, who yeah. used to work for us. We actually left work uh, oh, early. This is a to, huge yeah, deal. Yeah, to go find it, and we did. And uh, that was probably the rarest bird I've ever seen. That's cool. Anything, anything out there that's on your list that you're like, man, that's like that's the what's your unicorn? Well, the nemesis bird, as as it's called in birding, for okay. me is is actually not a super rare bird in the southern part of the country, but it's sort of rare in Wisconsin. It's yellow crown night heron, and it's it's kind of like a snuffleupagus type thing. If you're familiar with the Sesame Street character, okay, that sure. 
it's never there when other people, only Big Bird sees it. But if Big Bird says, hey, Mr. Snuffleupagus is here, no one else can ever find him because he, he always... So yellow crown night heron is a bird that gets reported, but if I go there, it's nowhere to be seen. Okay. So okay. I can leave five minutes later, someone will find it. I can go back five minutes later and it's gone. So I've, like, I've missed this bird over and over and over. And embarrassingly, I've been to Florida six times and South Texas six times where the bird is can be found all year and haven't been able to find one. So that is the, a nemesis. The point is, is if you want to see a yellow crown night heron, just don't follow me around. Let me ask you this because yeah. we just had a did a little quick talk on the, the Sasquatch. Do you think you're actually going to be happy if you saw it? Or do well, you think I would be happy. Yeah. You would? Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Okay. It's not yeah. quite Sasquatch level. Well, I know, but Big sometimes, foot, whatever sometimes it is. you know, you, you, you kind of have we, this thing that's out there, yeah. and it's always, and then all of a sudden you find it, and then it's over. We should talk about binos. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you're into. Let's talk about binoculars. Uh, Mike, we brought you on here because you know binoculars very, very well. And, um, you know, binoculars are something that uh, they can be complicated they can also be very simple in in many ways especially when you look at them compared to like a rifle scope a rifle scope there's so many different features that can be essentially bolted on or attached on to just the optic itself whereas the binoculars really kind of strip that away to just to really just come down to being an observation optic um but a lot of people ask us questions because there are different configurations. There's different models. There's different levels and tiers. Uh, we had at uh, Ohio Huntsman podcast. I remember he was asking us on Instagram about, you know, what's the best binocular configuration to get for somebody, you know, who doesn't hunt out west of the Mississippi, you know, that those kind of aspirational mountain hunts. Um, and then you still, on the other hand, you have people who are going on those big western hunts and they're going to be seeing these vast expanses and they start wondering to themselves, you know, like, well, do I just keep getting bigger magnification? Do I do I want to go for the bigger objective? Uh, is optical quality, how high in optical quality do I need to go? Um, and you can ask those questions until you're blue in the face. And still, there's just a lot of different binoculars to choose from. They all kind of look generally the same, too, which doesn't always help. You know, rifle scopes sometimes have different knobs and bells and stuff that's kind of, oh, yeah, I know I want that. Um, so Mike is going to help us break it down a little bit. And... Mike, if you have somebody call up and they're they're talking and they they call up and they say, "Hey, Mike, I need a set of binoculars, but I'm not sure what to look for." Like, where do you start generally with somebody? What's kind of the the anatomy of a binocular that you go through with them? Uh, yeah, how does that go? Well, I think one of the one of the things I, I like to do in this podcast is kind of demystify some of the things that I I think that um, not only um, the buying public might be uh, unsure about, but even other industry people. Um, so one of the things that um, you want to ask a customer is, what are they going to use it for? Now, I know some people think that one of the first questions you should ask is, how much do you want to spend on a pair of binoculars? Which right. might not always come across as the most uh, inf- informationally gathering question that you can get from them. Because uh, in a lot of cases, after you explain what binoculars can do, they may be willing to spend a little more money knowing what the limitations are, either by glass quality or aperture size or magnification. We'll get into all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for, I don't know if you want to, for people who might be completely unfamiliar with binoculars, yeah, do you want to even go, go over into... like what a binocular basically yeah. is in the yeah, parts Yeah, some of, of the basic parts and whatnot. Yeah. So really a binocular is just two telescopes connected together that are optically aligned so you can use them stereoscopically with both eyes. And you look in the eyepiece or ocular side and the opposite end that you point away from you, those are the objective lenses that gather light. AKA and the aperture, right? The aperture, exactly. And then in, in uh, uh, reference to that far side cartoon, I think it is, with the huge mathematical formula on one side and the result on the other, something magic happens here. Something magic happens between the objective lens and the eyepiece. It's light transmission. How much light can you get through the objective lens, through another section of glass called the prism block in the middle of the binocular, and then the eyepiece, which is comprised of different lens elements. Mm-hmm. How much of that light can exit out of the uh, eyepiece that can get into your your eye, into your pupillary opening? Mm-hmm. And light too. This is one thing I think I've maybe mentioned a couple times, but I, I like to mention it because a lot of times people, when they think of light, they just think of they think of light as just brightness. 
like uh, almost like you can just dial it up or dial it back. Like it's almost an intensity or something, um, you know, because you turn on the lights when you're in your room or in an office or something like that. You turn on the lights and usually they're just bright white light to, to shine light on things. Um, you know, but light also has when you just look at a wall, like I'm looking at a wall across me right now. and It is a green wall. It's green because of light. You know, correct, and, it's, and it's, like the wood is brown yeah. because of light and the different wavelengths and things. Without delving too much into physics, we can say that light is both uh, a particle and a wavelength, and it gets reflected off of surfaces. So the green that you're seeing is actually reflected light that originated from the light fixture that we've turned on, and that's reflected light. Well, with binoculars, um, it isn't so much collecting light is that light rays are everywhere in this room. Yeah. And those light rays are hitting the objective lens. And we want to get as much of those light rays in, as possible into the optical system so that we can render a, a quality, a bright image that's pleasing to the eye. But um, every time light hits a glass surface, uh, something good can happen and something bad can happen. And you might hear that a lot in my, um, my presentation on binoculars is I'll say, like with magnification, more is not necessarily better. Whenever you change either the aperture size or the magnification, something good happens and something bad happens. Well, the bad thing that happens when light hits a glass surface is some of it gets reflected off. We don't want that to happen. The good thing that happens is some of the light gets into the objective cell and through it, through mm -hmm. the lens. And that's sometimes sort of misrepresented as collecting light it's just light is entering the optical system, and we want to keep that light, and we want to get it through the optical system undistorted. Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of times when people are looking at a binocular to get, some of their, I would say, we kind of narrowed it, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, I, we kind of narrowed it down to four big things that I think people look at, which is, you know, you see this magnification. So if it's 8 by 42 binocular, that 8 means that you're magnifying everything you look at eight times. Right. They look at, you know, optical quality. How good does that image look to my eye? Um, and then, I guess with magnification too, we, we should, they look at objective size <laughs> as well. So that's that, that second number, that 8 by 42, it's 42 millimeter objective. Um, they look at size and weight, and then also price. And those are some of the things that confuse people. You know, why are there so many different kinds of configurations and stuff? Yeah. You know, is there one that's the magic ideal one? Or I think there is. I, and I think that that uh, can be answered uh, from two different perspectives, bird watchers and hunters, or birders and outdoorsy people. Birders are outdoorsy people, too. But um, to my mind, uh, 842 has always been kind of the, the base to start from. And you can increase or decrease magnification by going to a different model. Um, you can increase or decrease aperture by going with a different model. And there are different reasons for my, you want, why you might want to do both or one of those two things. So it's going to change the nature of the binocular by changing mm -hmm. the magnification or changing the aperture size. 842 is kind of the, the general all-purpose binocular. 8 power is pretty easy for most people to hold steady. The 42... Um, is a large enough aperture to render a, what we call a large exit pupil. Yeah. And that's in millimeters, the diameter of the shaft of light that comes out of the eyepiece that can enter into your, your pupillary opening. And you can calculate that uh, just by taking the aperture, 42, and dividing it by the magnification. So if you do that division, you get 5.25. So you can actually see the exit pupil. If I hold the binocular right mm -hmm. here, that circle of light you see, that's 5.25 millimeters in yeah. diameter. So for those listening right now, what he's doing is if you hold your binoculars, you know, when you hold them up to your face properly, what you're going to see is just, you know, hopefully the whole image there. But as you pull the binoculars away from your face, you know, you kind of get all of a sudden the image sort of goes away and there's these little, there's these little lights that, that you can kind of see the image through them. Uh, but that is the exit pupil there. And, and your eye is not exactly in the right spot or where the eye relief or that is Correct. ideal Correct. Uh, at that point, but that is the exit pupil. It's and almost like an eye staring back at you, where the pupil is, is yeah. white. And and I'm sure you'll get into it, you know, like why that's even important, why you should yep. even care about exit and, pupil. Yeah, I think we should talk about that. So the reason that exit pupil is so important is the larger that exit pupil is, the brighter the image is going to be in low light. So let's take, for example, you got an 8x42, 
the exit pupil, as we said, is 5.25 millimeters. Now, you might have uh, an optics user say, well, I need a 10, so I'm going to get a 10 by 42. That's great. They're going to get something. They're going to get a, uh, their subjects are going to be larger because they've jumped from 8 power to 10 power. So things are going to look bigger when they look through the binocular. The downside is if you do the calculation for exit pupil, which is aperture divided by magnification, you've dropped from 5.25 millimeters to 4.2 millimeters in diameter. Right. So it's a smaller exit pupil. You're, you're conceding when you go from an 842 of the same glass quality to a 1042, you get the magnification, but you give up mm -hmm. a little bit of exit pupil. And like you said, that was a pretty key point I think you brought up. With the same level of optical quality, correct. Right? So let's say you got to be, you got to make sure you're staying within the same. You know, if we're talking about a crossfire, we're talking about a Diamondback, talking about a Viper. Compare Viper to Viper. Don't compare yeah. Viper to Razor, because then all of a sudden you're entering in all whole new bag of tricks with optical systems it, and stuff. Exactly. And, there are different kinds of cross comparisons you want to do like with like. If you're comparing uh, brightness. Uh, within a binocular model, like let's say you're just looking at Viper binoculars and you just want the Viper that performs the best in low light, exit pupil may be really important there. Right. But it may not be as important if you're looking across $100 binoculars up to $2,000 binoculars. Absolutely. Because then as you go up in price, you're buying more efficient light transmission, which may make a brighter image with a smaller exit pupil than a less expensive binocular with a wider exit pupil. Exactly. And I, oh, that was a little complicated. So oh, that's, that's <laughs> fine. So, you know, because one thing is, you know, when people hear exit pupil and they hear, okay, so I just need a big exit pupil, right? And it, it's kind of like, um, you know, they, they, that might lead them to believe, well, just crank that objective lens up. Just keep cranking it until you get the biggest thing possible. And uh, I think one thing that's worth mentioning is sort of um, what what that's actually doing. Because, like you mentioned, there's a there's a like a shaft of light. I think you mentioned that comes back to your eye and it yeah. meets up with your pupil. Your pupil can only get so big. That's correct, and that's a good point. Now, uh, let's compare, let's say, a compact binocular like a 10 by 28 to a 10 by, 10 by 42. Mm -hmm. At midday, your pupillary opening might only be two millimeters. Because you're this sunny out, your sunny out, your pupil's going to constrict. Let's say the opening of your pupillary opening is only two millimeters. What's the exit pupil of a 10 by 28? 2.8 millimeters. And a 10.42? 4.2 millimeters. In both cases, you're going to get wasted light hitting your iris. Mm -hmm. So the image brightness, if the glass quality is the same, is going to be about the same. Right. But the 10.42 is still giving you one extra thing, and that's better resolution. So mm -hmm. you can kind of think of, imagine like, a number of pixels coming out of the binocular, the eyepiece, that can get through your eye. A 10 by 28 doesn't have as many pixels coming out as a 1042 does. So think of the photon energy as making a higher resolution image at 10 power with the two millimeter opening of your pupil. Yeah. Again, that's kind of a complex thing to think about. The point is, is that if you're not a low light performer and you want to keep it on the light, a 10 by 28 might make really good sense. Yeah. If you want 10 power and you're a kayaker or if you're a backpacker and you're, you're concerned about the amount of weight you're hauling. Yeah. But if you got to have low light performance, you don't want a 10 by 28 because of that really narrow exit pupil. Because in low light, your pupillary opening, depending on your age, could be five millimeters up to six millimeters or more. And in that case, your, your pupil is going to allow the 4.2 millimeter exit pupil, all that light to enter into your eye, and the compact's going to have 2.8 millimeter shaft of light entering your eye. Well, clearly, glass being equal, the 1042 is going to look a lot brighter than the 10 by 28 because of that exit pupil uh, right. difference. Right. We were discussing exit pupil. We kind of went zero to 60 on you there a little bit because we went from beginning to all of a sudden exit pupil and mathematics that you're actually doing to, to calculate that. It does kind of go to show you, though, how all these things are connected and how there are these trade-offs in optics. Anytime you change one little thing and you think you're going to just, oh, just think, make that one change and it's perfect, oh, no, nope, everything else is affected. Uh, but, Mark, you were, you were really, uh, you were wanting to come in there with a question, I could tell. Well, so you, what was it? You, cover, you covered the one thing that I was going to ask, because I was going to ask if there's, you know, you're talking about, you know, 
the amount of light that can enter your, your eye and is there like essentially a point of diminishing returns where if you had like this giant exit pupil, like is that necessarily better? So we right. covered that. So my other question though, and Mike, Mike brought up a comparison and we're talking about, you know, wanting to make things, you know, apples to apples when you're comparing, you know, I guess like items. But we also brought kind of an apples to oranges comparison up when you were talking about a higher end bino being able to compensate because of its you know superior optical design, maybe superior materials for um, have for having a smaller exit pupil. So my question yeah. was in a ten thousand mile long question, um, could it be a rule of thumb then if if your budget only allows you to buy kind of like a, maybe a more entry level type binocular, should should you back off that magnification? Like, because you, you recommended the eight power, I generally always use a ten for pretty much not everything, but that's my go to, I guess. I'm I'm going to answer that question a couple of ways because I don't think there is just one answer for it. A common uh, uh, misconception uh, out there that I hear is is that. A person buys an 8x42 binocular, let's say it's, it's $100, and they've been using it for a couple of years, and they, f- they feel like they need something better now. They've developed whatever it is their interest is, whether it's hunting or birding. They feel like, this binocular has taken me this far, I need something better. And they believe better means going w- from, let's say if it's an 8x42 they had, going to a 10x42 mm-hmm. or a 10 by 50 When there's another way um, to solve the same problem, stick with 8x42, but buy the next model or two up Mm -hmm. because that will deliver a sharper, brighter image. It isn't necessarily making things bigger that helps you see more. Mm -hmm. It's improving the glass quality that helps you see more. Mm -hmm. But it can also be the case that, let's say a person doesn't want to spend more than a couple hundred dollars on a pair of binoculars, but they do want to improve their game somewhat. In that case, going from an 8x42 to a 1042 or 1050 might be the right choice for them. Hmm. Interesting. One thing I feel like also throwing out there as well, Mike's used this term, and I know we all kind of use this term, is when we talk about glass quality. Um, There is, when you step it up in, in like, again, like we go from Crossfire to Dime back to Viper to Razor, um, there is an improvement in the quality of the glass itself. And I think sometimes people start start going like, you know, what kind of glass does it have? You know, like, right. and then they almost start a- feel, feeling like they should actually f- ask about the physical glass itself. You know, like, well, that, that one just has, just the physical glass is better. And that's it. Um, when we say glass quality, we're actually referring to essentially the entire optical system. Because remember, this is all, this is all functioning as, as one big system. Uh, and it's not always just the glass that's improving. Um, you have other things that improve when you step it up from line to line, which are things like what the glass is coated in. Um, Mike brought up the fact that uh, when light hits your objective lens or any lens throughout the optical system, the ideal thing would be that the light passes through it and it doesn't get reflected because when light gets reflected, that means that some of it isn't making it to your eye to make the image look like what it would or what it should look like. And those coatings that you can put on, they're anti-reflective coatings, so they, they mitigate some of that reflection. And then you have the spacing of the lenses and the different curvatures of the lenses and the lens shapes, and you have the prisms that are in there, which prisms are a crazy thing we'll, we'll talk about here in a bit, too. Um, they look like the thing from the old, um, what is it? What was that band that had the prism on there? Uh, oh, um, oh, Pink Floyd. Yeah. yeah, there you go, man. Uh, yeah. Dark side of the moon. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you kind of got like a Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon in the middle of your binocular. Yeah. But anyway, um, felt like throwing that out there. Well, that's a good point. Um, you do have the the three components of of the binocular, and it isn't just coatings, but it it should also be uh, stressed that everything, every component, whether it's the ocular design or eyepiece design, the prism block or the objective cell. And the anti-reflective optical coatings, all of these things can be pr- produced, engineered in gradations. Mm-hmm. So something could be called coated or fully coated or fully multi-coated, and then it could have 10 coatings, 
20 coatings. So, and we don't know necessarily when we're shopping for binoculars what a lot of these things are is because the manufacturers consider it to be proprietary information mm -hmm. and the types of anti-reflective coatings. So though on, on a website or on paper, a lot of the binoculars will read very, very similarly. And yep. it, it can be yep. sort of distressing to c customers who say, your Diamondback reads just like your Razor. What's the difference? I don't understand. Why Why is this one so much more expensive than this one? Yeah. They're both it's 10, 10 by 42. 42. They're, They're yeah. both fully multi-coded. Exactly. Yeah. And they both have it HD read, glass. And it might be one subtle thing that's that's different in the writing, but what, what they don't know is uh, it may have the same type of, of prism, like a BAK4 prism, but you can get BAK4 prisms in different quality gradations yeah. for better light transmission. Same thing's true with the quality of the glass, the coatings, the eyepiece elements. So generally, as you spend more and more money um, on a pair of binoculars, it's improving the entire optical system. Yeah, It right. might read very, very similarly. Like, you might just find one additional thing. Both binoculars are phase corrected. Both binoculars are fully multi coated. Both have BAK4 prisms. Why are they different? Oh, look at this one. There's one more thing on this binocular. It has something called ED glass. Yeah. Which Boom, means, that's got to be it. Yeah. You extra know. low dispersion glass. Well, that may be true. And ED glass is a type of glass that uh, light transmits more efficiently through. Even that can be uh, obtained in gradations. Mm -hmm. But that, while well, that's the only thing that might read differently, End users should know, customers should know that really pretty much everything in the binocular has changed when you jump from, say, a Crossfire to a Diamond Bag to a Viper to a Razor. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely, definitely worth noting, I think, especially, you know, because sometimes you do get that question where it's like, you know, why is a Razor so expensive? Or I can't believe I'd ever spend that much money on a binocular. You know, it's like, well, there's just a lot nicer stuff in there. Um, Man, so where are there's there's uh, if you haven't figured it out yet, folks, you can make binoculars as complicated as you want. Um, but we were discussing exit pupil, which kind of got into the uh, well, it gets into both objective size and magnification size. And you were mentioning how for somebody who's like an outdoors person, uh, just general kind of usage. Uh, in a lot of ways, for you, it seems like the uh, the standard is an eight by forty two. And anything from there, whether you change magnification or objective size, is kind of a deviation to give up something in order to gain something. How about for the hunter? What's, yeah. what's that look like well, for them? Does one thing I want to I want to kind of is I don't just have eight by forty two binoculars. I've right, got I've right. got eight by twenties, eight by twenty fives, eight by thirty twos, ten by fifties. I've got lots of different binoculars that I use for different purposes. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you talk about magnification and aperture size, it is somewhat application driven. There's no law that says you have to use an eight by forty two for birding and you can't use a ten by fifty, or no law that you when you go out west, you have to use a 10 by 50 or 12 by 50. You can use any binocular for any, anything you want. But there is kind of an optimal uh, criteria for certain applications. If you're going out west, um, you probably shouldn't bring an 8 by 20 with you unless, you know, there's some compelling reason. Maybe it's a backup binocular that you just want in your pocket all the time if you're yeah. doing other things besides hunting. But because the, the distances are, are usually generally much further away than someone who's bird watching, who's probably, you know, looking at birds within 50 yards most of the time. But if you're hunting out west, you might be looking mile, five miles or more. And so you're going to really want that extra magnification bump to be able to see what you're looking for. Uh, whether it's a 12 by 50 or a 15 by 56, as you get up there, though, in higher magnifications, which lend themselves to that type of activity, you may want to tripod mount them, too, because the steadiness becomes a factor in higher magnifications. Mm, Me, personally, yeah. I do not hold a 12-power binocular very well. I can do a 10, hold a 10-power binocular pretty steady. 8 is just fine, but everybody's different, and you want to make sure it's, it's good to try binoculars before you buy them if you're not going to tripod mount them, if you're thinking of a 12 you might want to practice with a 12 in a store first before you actually plunk, plunk down for it. Right, right. Yeah, and that's that's one thing, too, because in a vacuum, you know, you think to yourself, well, I'm going to be looking at stuff far away. Jack up the magnification, right. you know? And uh, it doesn't matter to me if the objective bell is a little bit bigger, you know, like for a 15 by 56 or something. Just jack up that magnification. That way I can see really far away. But they do kind of take out the element of when you do that, it becomes harder to hold steady, 
And that is something that can make all the difference in identifying what you're looking at. I mean, just that little bit of shake, you're magnifying any little shakes that your hands naturally have. It's not just something that, you know, older people have and younger people don't have it. I mean, everybody has a natural just slight shake. Oh, oh yeah, shake. Especially you're, when you're, you're holding, breathing. Yeah, when you're, you're holding something up to your face too, your arms start to get kind of tired and yeah, arm fatigue, the wind could be blowing. I mean, any any number of things. Yeah. Heck, we recommend, I mean, if you can, right? If you have a tripod with you or willing to carry one uh, and you're hunting, put put your tens on a tripod. Put your yeah. eights on a tripod. It makes a, it makes a huge difference. You're going to spot is, more game. It's baffling. Any, any magnification, tripod mounted, looks better than hand, hand holding it, even eights. Mm-hmm. But I, one time I did have a showroom customer who was so set forth on, set on tens and then I had him compare model, same model to same model, the 8s and 10s, and this particular individual could read signs with the 8 that he couldn't with the 10 just out of unsteadiness on sure. the 10. Yeah. So yeah. 10 is not always better if you can't hold it steady. But if you tripod mount it, then it's a level playing field again. Yeah. The extra magnification is going to give you... Uh, larger objects that you can study and, and see well. Yeah, you and take the, your own error sort yeah, of out of the equation. Yeah. You let the binoculars yep, do the exactly. work. Yep, exactly. And there's little tricks you can do, too. I'm sure you know a lot of them, Mike, as far as, like, oh, you can, you can if you've got a, a build hat on, you can, you know, you know kind of grab the top of your bill uh, and kind of brace your hands on that. You can suck your elbows in and, you know, brace them on your chest. I mean, is there anything that you found a, that works really well? If there's a tree you can lean up against, yep. that'll help you stabilize the binocular, or you can get into the prone position if there's a rock or something, something you can lean against um, that can help you study the binocular. So you just, you know, be aware of your surroundings, see what there is that you can use. If you don't have a tripod with, you can maybe use... Um, you know, a feature of, of something on the ground to help stabilize your, your view. A walking yeah, stick. Even, even, a, a, walking even stick a monopod or, a, yeah. or a, a trekking pole can help you stabilize a binocular in a pinch. Mm-hmm. Steadiness is, is pretty huge. So for you discussing to somebody who's going to be hunting, what are you suggesting to somebody knowing also, too, I mean, I guess in, in many ways there's a, different suggestion you might make for the guy who's out in Ohio, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, versus the guy who's in Utah, Montana. Or bow Wyoming. hunting versus, you know. Or bow hunting yeah. versus rifle hunting, too, even. How does that go down? Well, generally, my experience has been not a bow hunter myself, but they'll usually want a smaller binocular, like a 32 millimeter or a, a compact, to have it out of the way of their chest. So something that isn't yeah. very prominent in front of them to get in the way of what they're doing. So I think, uh, you know, a smaller 8x32 or 10x32, which we have in our Diamondback line, mm-hmm. um, is, a, is a good solution for a bow hunter. But, um, and, that, and I would say that that can be dependent on location as well. There may be um, applications even for a bow hunter where they're going to want a larger aperture yep. binocular. And again, getting back to my, you know, there's no law that says just because. This is the definitive We choice, recommend right? this for hunting, so you have to, you have to do that. But if it's if it's hunting out west, I, I generally start to gravitate immediately t- towards ten forty twos, tens, either ten fifty or ten forty two or twelves, twelve yeah. by fifty. Now uh, we had a discussion the other day when we were trying to talk about. Um, I think is even you know hopefully coming up with some some videos or something like that that could break it down for people. And we discussed the difference between the ten fifty and the ten forty two, and. This is one where I was even talking with Mark about it this morning. Yep. And Mark was, I, w- I was saying, well, Mark, this is something interesting we'll bring up the podcast, 10 by 42 versus 10 by 50. And he said, well, I don't know if that's that interesting. We should talk about 10 42 versus 12 by 50. And, you know, because uh, you said you thought pretty much 10 50 and 10 42, it's kind of a, kind of a wash, kind of a horse apiece. For you, at least. For me, and and when I've used both, I've mm-hmm. felt it's been a little bit of a wash. But, Mike, I mean, you've spent what a lot of time the, behind them. Yeah, what yeah, are the differences, well, and why would you choose one over the other? Not not a wash. Like, I know I know what I'm giving up, and I know what I'm what giving. What are you giving up? Huh? What, what are you giving up if you go to a 1042 versus a 1050? Just in my opinion, so I think I'm getting a little bit less um, low-light performance. Correct. Keeping yep. the 10 mm-hmm. by 42. All right. But what I'm getting is a, a full size binocular, but still a lighter weight and a smaller. But frame. you are giving up one more thing, going from a 1050 to a 1042. Field of view. Not necessarily. No. Um, resolution, optical resolution, which is detail at distance. Your ability. Let's say you had a 1042 and a 1050 of the same glass quality. 
the 1050 is going to give you better distance resolution because of the larger aperture. Remember the photon energy thing? I was talking about pixels more. There's yeah. still more information going into your eye through okay. the 10 by even if your X pupil is constricting blocking some of the light, mm -hmm. you're going to have more detail out of the 10 by 50. So not only does it give you better low light performance, but it's always even if your axi pupil is your pupillary opening is blocking some of the light, your iris, um, you're still going to have more detail to look at, more information, more ability, better ability to see things at distance mm -hmm. out of the 10 by 50. Now, the downside is it's larger and heavier. That's, again, getting to, there's always going to be a trade-off. Yeah. Give and take. Give and take. Now, it, getting to field of view, generally speaking, uh, most 1050s uh, will have a slightly narrower field than your 10 by 42s. And that's because... it's always baffling. Yeah. Yeah, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah. People tend to think that the aperture size, the 50 or 42, is the field of view. But it's merely just the diameter of the objective lens in millimeters. Yeah. But what actually constricts the field of view is the length of the binocular. There's like an upper limit to... It's like a, the cardboard tube effect. If you have a short cardboard tube and you hold it up to your, your eye, you can see more through it than a really long cardboard tube. Oh, okay, the yeah. physically longer the binocular is, the less maximum field of view you can get out of it. Still, the uh, manufacturer can tweak the eyepiece des design to get a wider field of view out of, out of a 10 by 50. You'll note this in our Viper line. Our Viper HD 10 by 50 has a slightly wider field field of view than our 10 by 42. Hmm. That's kind of an exception out there. Generally speaking, 10 by 42s will have a slightly larger field of view. Yeah. Well, correction. That was quite interesting. Yeah. Suck it, Mark. <laughs> Here, I concede the fact. I, I openly concede the fact. It's basically a public apology, and your response is, suck it. <laughs> okay. I see where we're at. I guess I do feel kind of bad about it, but I'm no, going to stick with no, it. Was, I, I think it was a great, I'm still going to stick with suck with it, though. I think it was a great um, question. It was a great question. And can you talk about, even though this is maybe kind of going in the weeds, can you talk about Twilight Factor? Because this was one thing where I was like, what? Yeah. There is a, a, an optical index called Twilight Factor, which is computed by multiplying the magnification by the aperture. So take it 10 by 50, multiply 10 by 50, 10 by 50 and uh, take the square root of that. And it'll give you a number like 18 to 25, somewhere in that, that ballpark for most binoculars. Um, take a 1042 and a 10 by 50. The 10 by 50 is going to win on both exit pupil and some, this thing called twilight factor. The larger the twilight factor is, the better that binocular does in discerning contrast in low light. So the 10 by 50 is better? The at? 10 by 50 is going to have a larger twilight factor. Now, here's what you're thinking. I thought the 10 by 42 was better at that. Nope. Um, it's, it's, if you figure it out, the math, you'll see. Shoot. So take 10 by well, here I was take 10 times 42. Gonna, yeah. No, there's, I know where you're going. Okay. We'll do that with the 12 by 50. Oh, okay. okay. We're just showing you first that the 1042 and the 1050, 10 times the 1050 42. is the winner both, both ways. Uh, well, I so the 1050 is the winner. Square, 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 square root, root of 500, square root of 420. All right. Square root of 420 is 20.49. Square root of 500 is 22. Okay, yep, you're right, 22. Yep. Now do, now do uh, a 1250. All right, square root of... All right, 12. <laughs> this is embarrassing. 12 times 50 is 600. I didn't have to do that. All right, square root <laughs> of 600. 24. 4.49. Which is bigger than the 10 by 50. Yes. Even though the 10 by 50 has a narrower exit pupil, the extra magnification helps one to see a little bit better contrast for moving subjects. So if your, if your application is such that you want to be able to detect in low light things moving around, you might actually want a 12 by 50. Even though the 10 by 50 has a slightly brighter image, it does not have as good of contrast for detecting movement. Okay. Which is what the human eye detects when right. you're trying to spot and game. And so twilight factor... Or at least a big part of it. Twilight yeah. factor, that square root of magnification times aperture, helps get you that kind of um, reference point to know, well, this is my application. Let me throw twilight factors and see how I do. Now, remember one thing about twilight factor and exit pupil. does not take glass coating quality or optical co quality, glass quality, into the equation. Right. So you could have a $100 12 by 50 
in a thousand dollar 12 by 50 and i can guarantee you that they're not going to have the same contrast in low light or the same brightness in low light because the better glass is going to always trump the weaker glass the, the less quality right. glass yeah so again we got to keep all they have similar. the same twilight factor and the same exit pupil but they won't give you the same image Understood. So it's only good for comparing uh, binoculars within uh, a model. Like, this is good for comparing all the Viper HDs. It's good for comparing all the Razor HDs. But it's not good for comparing the Razor HD 10 by 50 to the Viper HD 10 by 50 Exactly. Yeah. So twilight factor has to do with contrast? Contrast and low light. It's been scientifically proven, Mark, that twilight factor Science. is a legitimate thing. Okay. That it, it it sounds it might sound a little bit like smoke and yeah, mirrors. It sounds made up. Yeah, it, but so it like, actually it actually bears out in the field that the larger twilight factor, glass being equal, coatings being equal, mm -hmm. better contrast detection in low light. Not necessarily the brighter image, but better contrast Correct. detection for things moving around. So like that that makes me wonder, you know, Mark. So if I'm talking about you know, oh, say a coos deer hunt where coos mm -hmm. deer kind of hang out in one spot, they're really hard to find. Is it the movement that eventually gives gives the coos deer up, or is it eventually you just finally stumbling upon it and just seeing it that gives it up? <clears throat> I mean, I'd say it depends on the scenario, right? So when I've hunted them, which is only twice, it's been early, it's been hot or early in in the season, hot October hunt. They're moving extremely slow, right? Unless you maybe you bump one or something like that. So when I found them. Generally, I mean, you're on the tripod and you move the tripod and you're like, oh my gosh, there's one. So not necessarily a huge movement thing. In fact, so maybe in that case, you might prefer the brighter image to... Maybe. But then also, also in that case, you're glassing those buggers up at oftentimes pretty extreme distances where mm -hmm. that extra magnification is going to be an asset. Okay. All right. I don't know. Like everything is so everything is situational and give and take. Everything's a trade-off. Have we just made it more complex for our customers to pick binoculars? I hope yep. not. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so all right. Well, that's just it with binoculars. You can get at the very. You can take it from any any angle. You yeah. can have it as less complex or as super complex as you want it to be. Yeah. So, what is it? What is it really like when you're talking? Because you talk with a lot of people on the phone. You've helped tons of people find the right binocular for them. You have pretty much every binocular I feel like ever made in your house. Um, like, what does it usually come down to when you're on the phone with somebody where they're like, where they're like, okay, yep, I think I know what I need now for my application. Like, what have you? What have you narrowed it down to? At in, that point? in the profession, we call it match. And the first binocular you buy might not necessarily be what you match well with, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's important, you know, kind of digress a little bit, to buy a binocular um, from a place you can return it to. If you notice right away within the first couple of weeks of owning it that this is not one I, I can really use, this is not going to work for me, that you can go back to the, to the dealer and say, hey, I tried it, you know, this isn't going to work, what else have you got? Well, that's also information. If a customer that I've recommended a 12 by 50 to or an 8 by 42 comes back, that's additional information for me to know, hey, they did not match up well with that particular recommendation. Mm -hmm. But now I know I, I've, I've got a better refined idea of what their needs are. Usually a person can just, I interview them, ask them a bunch of questions and listen to their responses, and I start crossing off binoculars in my mind. Nope, they're not a compact. Nope, they're not a 15X. And then I, I narrow it down, and price gets put in there too at some point, yeah. where I'm not going to recommend, well, just take a look at this you know, $1,000 plus binocular then, um, unless they, they want to go there, if they mention the, the, the names, the model names. And then I'll kind of narrow it down to maybe a diamond back, it's a, they're either 8x42 or 10x42, and ask the pertinent questions to see, are they, do they want more magnification? Are they looking beyond 100 yards most of the time? Or are they going to be within 100 yards? Sometimes something that simple will mm -hmm. uh, change my recommendation to them. If they're within 100 yards, I might, I'll probably go 8x42. If they're outside 100 yards for their observations, I'll probably recommend 10x42. Hmm. So I just narrow it down, whittle it down, and see if I can get that match for them. Yeah. And then there's uh, you know a whole other side of this where they get the binocular and it doesn't match well with their hands. The ergonomic feel isn't what they thought. That's True. something we can't really figure out over, over a phone call or a photograph. 
um, you know, an online ad or something. So sometimes someone will get a binocular and just say, I just d- didn't like the way that it felt in my hand. Yeah. So back to the drawing board on that. But the good thing is, is you can always come back to the drawing board. Now, a guy like me, if he if he gets a binocular he doesn't totally match up with, probably keeps it anyway and just adds <laughs> it to the collection. So. Um, and you, you brought up, too, you know, where this is one of the unfortunate things. I know I've been asked this a lot, and it's it's been expressed to me as a frustration for some people, and I can't really blame any party exactly, but when you go into most dealers, a lot of times you're under nice fluorescent lighting, it's midday, you know, because that's when they're open, and you say, hey, can I, even if you say, can I take these outside, you know, if it's a nice bright sunny day out, you're going to take them outside, you're going to say, well, gee, this $150 binocular looks just as good as the $700 binocular. So, you know, and then, and that's kind of where you run into some trouble and, and people will say, well, it's like, well, how do I ever end up knowing? Like, it seems like the biggest times you'll notice the differences are when light is kind of at a premium, which, which, you know, and so, um, in many ways, like you said, Mike, you kind of got to try to do your best to get really close to what you're going to end up needing and then just try something. Well, the more educated a dealer is, I think the better they can get to that match point with their with their consumer. I think the an opportunity the customer has to look at further distances is important because it is true that you can take inexpensive binoculars and really expensive binoculars and look at something 50 feet away and there might not be that much difference in the image mm-hmm. for something that close under that kind of, you know, fluorescent lighting. You might not notice some of the subtle things that can change when you're outside or in challenging light situations. So I think the customer does have to kind of keep that in mind when they're at a store where they're, where they can't take them outside and really use them to know that that's not always the full story of how that binocular is going to perform in a real life outdoor situation. Yeah. Yeah. What about a resolution chart? I think if you have one, it can help to bring one to a store that you can set up maybe 50 feet away. The problem with that is, is you really want to be able to stabilize a binocular um, to really notice a difference on a resolution chart, even right. at 50 feet. If you're even if with an eight, it's hard to really pick out the lines of resolution on a on a resolution chart true. to know whether or not one's performing better than the other. That is true. Yeah, I should actually maybe actually can you describe a resolution chart? We just kind of brought that up as like something that people might know about, but I would never have known. About yeah, I guess that the classic model is the 1951 Air Force resolution chart. You can Google it and see what they look like. Um, the two most important areas for me on it are the pinwheel, um, which I use to check for color aberrations, and the various vertical and horizontal lines of resolution, which are numbered. And I try to see the very smallest lines of resolution. I want to see if I can split the lines. I can still see that it's not just one big thick line, but I can see with the binocular that it's comprised of three vertical lines or three horizontal lines. Yeah. Um, there are other aspects of resolution charts that I don't pay as much attention to, but the black and white pinwheel is a good one to check for what we call chromatic aberration, which is the purple or green color fringing in contrast areas. Yeah, exactly. And that's just from a less efficient optical system. Lesser efficient optical systems will show themselves compared to high-end optical systems in that regard because they're not doing as good of a job of keeping all the all the Correct. light rays in line, Correct. essentially. Yeah. Which and is, so they start splitting out, and you start seeing some other color hues or light yeah. waves. Which a lot of people don't know is when you hear a, that a binocular has extra low dispersion glass, what you've just said is light dispersion mm-hmm. on a focal point. It's not arriving at the same focal point. A little bit of complex um, concept, but that's what's causing chromatic aberration. The color fringing, not all the waves of light are arriving at the same focal point, but if you use low dispersion glass, it decreases the dispersion, sharpens up the optical image because you don't have the color distortion. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's important to have extra low dispersion glass or some other type of special glass that eliminates the color fringing. And right. When, so, and then color fringing presents as, like, so if a person was to look at something and see color fringing, like, what would be a scenario where they might see that? And Probab- then what yeah. does it look like? Probably the most common t- uh time someone reports it, they'll call us up and say, what is this? Um, 
is if they're looking at tree branches without leaves on them, like in the wintertime or something, and they look up at the sky and they see these tree branches, they'll notice on one side of every branch there's a purple glow, and Mm -hmm. on the opposite side of the branch there's a green or yellow glow. They see it for the first time and they think there, there may be something defective with their binocular. What they're seeing is completely normal. All binoculars, all binoculars have chromatic oh, aberration. Oh, there's that voice. Yeah, they have. Even the world's best binoculars will have some chromatic aberration. This color, this color fringing, just some take almost all of it out. But you can still find it if you look for it. And each human is differentially susceptible to chromatic. I might not see as much as you do. You might not see as much as as me. So um, it, I can guarantee you, it's there in every binocular. Where you don't want it where you want it the least or don't want it is in the center of the field of view. I can guarantee you, you'll see it on the edge of every binocular, on the edge of the, of the field. It's just going to be more prevalent there, like edge distortion is, where the image is a little bit out of focus. Um, but that greenish glow in high contrast areas, like dark branches against the sky, like a resolution chart, the black and white pinwheel. Um, Something against the bright snow. Yes. Any, anywhere you, you have really contrasting elements, on the terminating edges, you're going to see chromatic aberration. Less in the center of the field, more towards the edge of the field. And we can eliminate that, or, well, not completely eliminate it. We can decrease it by using certain coatings, certain types of glass systems, and certain types of glass. But as you put more and more of that into the optical system, up goes the price, which is generally why yeah. you see binoculars at the low end of the price spectrum have more chromatic aberration than binoculars at the higher end of the price spectrum. And the reason why you don't want it is because it decreases resolution. If you think of a complex image, optical image, with a lot of detail in it, that chromatic aberration is actually present everywhere there's terminating contrast. Mm -hmm. So you think of a white page with just alphanumeric characters on it. Imagine just seeing them as black and white. They read really easy. Now put purple and green color fringing on the edges of them and make them smaller and smaller and smaller. Pretty soon, it looks all fudged together and blurry because it's distortion. That's right. why you don't want it. Right. And depending on how you're using that binocular, it could be a bigger deal or less a big deal, too. Yeah, exactly. And that's it, it gets down to preference, too, regardless of how much you can see it or not. It also, you know, it's yeah. just... Yeah. At preference. a sporting event, it might not matter. If you're a birder who has to know the difference between a grasshopper sparrow and a, a, a Henslow sparrow, it might make a difference for the subtle field marks. Been there. If, if you need to see, <laughs> if you need to see, an, if it. you need to see antler points at far distances, it's it's going to make a difference. Yep. True. We're kind of getting into optical quality uh, here, and it brings up one thing that I'm sure we're going to get asked a lot because at the time of uh, this recording, or I actually should say, the time this recording will release, we will have released as well, like a Diamondback HD and the Crossfire HD. And HD is a term that is related to the optical quality of that product. And, you know, these are updates on the regular Diamondback, the regular Crossfire. Now they have this HD added on. And you were talking about, you know, it is definitely an, an upgrade, and you've seen through many different binoculars. You know, kind of how to pick things out. Uh, but what what's going on when you upgrade an optical system? Like, what what happened in there? What is HD? Um, you know, all that stuff. Well, HD uh, stands for either high density or high definition. It, they're interchangeable. Um, HD itself in our uh, profession is more of a marketing term than it then does it mean some specific criteria um, about the kind of glass. Mm -hmm. You can call uh, extra low dispersion HD glass. You Mm -hmm. can call fluorite crystal glass HD glass. You can call an apochromatic lens system HD glass. You can call a a coating scheme HD glass. So the manufacturer can pretty much call anything they want HD. Mm -hmm. It should generally represent, though, an enhancement to a prior version. If you have, you know, a binocular name Ralph and you come out with Ralph HD, we sure hope that Ralph HD has a better optical presentation um, than the original non-HD version. And I think it's, well, I know since I've looked through them extensively that our new Crossfire HD and our Diamondback Diamondback HD are enhanced uh, I can see the difference in brightness and color tone. Mm-hmm. Um, they're more color neutral, so they're not 
warm or cool. They're very neutral, which is, I think, ideal. No matter if you're a hunter or a birder, you want color to be the right color. And I think that that's been improved in the Crossfire HD and the Diamondback HD. Warm, everything kind of looks a little orangey. Yeah, or... some people call it, they say it looks like I'm looking through a split pea soup or something. You know, yeah. it looks kind of soupy. And cool, uh, it, it, the whites tend to look blue, kind of bluish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where neutral, it when you put the binocular down, the color shouldn't change. It should when you put the binocular back to your eye, the color should stay the same. That's what we mean by color neutral. To me, the the new HD binoculars we have are very color neutral, so they do a lot better job on color tone. And um, and I I also think that we've sharpened up the images too through both binoculars. They're definitely to my eye. Uh, rendering much better center resolution than the prior models. Mm -hmm. Still not something, and this is where I got into the part where a lot of people are going to ask questions as well, not just what changed, but also then, hey, I don't get it. Why do you call it the Razor HD? Is the Crossfire HD just as good or not as good? You know, because they're both called HD, to your point. And and like you were saying, it is kind of a it is kind of a marketing term. It doesn't it's not it's not specifically connected to one thing or another. You know, but what what is it that kind of makes Crossfire HD, hundred and fifty bucks or whatever, versus then a Razor HD. Um, not even getting well, into the UHD yeah. yet, but you know, like a grand. Yeah. Getting back to what I what I said before um, about everything can be acquired in in gradations in increments. So if you compare binocular to binocular, you know, a, a UHD to um, the Crossfire HD, yeah, both of them have HD on them. They're, we call that high definition or high density. But even though they both have uh, uh, an ocular or eyepiece component, a prism block component, and an objective cell component, the glass over on this side, on the, on the UHD side, is much higher quality for more efficient light transmission. The anti-reflective coatings are higher quality for reducing reflected or ghosting. Um, the prism block is completely different. In this, it's it's an um, Abe Koenig prism, which is the first bin- a vortex binocular to have that type of prism block. Hmm. It's a type of prism block that has a lot less re- internal reflections. So it again, it's a huge improvement over the the prism design in the Crossfire. Uh, Which is the same, actually, style of prism as the Dimebacks and the Vipers and, yeah. and the Razor HD. These are both roof prism binoculars, mm-hmm. but the prism itself, the system, is is totally different. Um, but if you take all those things, compound all those things, you're just getting a lot higher light transmission, accurate light transmission, through the UHD compared to the Crossfire HD. In its class, in, say, the under $200 price point, you could classify this binocular compared to its competition as an HD binocular. It, it has enhanced coatings and glass, so that makes it, we can call it fairly, HD in its price class. But price should always be an indicator to the consumer that, hey, this $200 HD binocular is not going to perform as optically, uh, as efficient. You're not going to get as good of an image compared to the UHD which, I, what's the street price going to be on it? I'm going to say around 1700 bucks on that. Really? F- 15 to 1700 okay. bucks. yeah. All right. So, um, I think I'm close. I think, is that, was that a 1042? Uh, this, is an eight, is that? this is an 8 by 42. I, I thought about, it was, I, I thought it was about four, 15 on that. 15, one. Yeah, yeah, 15. Yeah. Okay. So, it, the price can actually be like an index in the mind of the consumer that it's in a certain price point where you should expect a higher quality optic than, uh, one that's priced at $200. Yeah. Uh, you're never, ever going to get, unless somebody wants to lose a lot of money, a $200 binocular that's going to outperform a $1,000 binocular. It's just because the quality of the materials used in this optic are much higher quality uh, than this one, mm-hmm. than the Crossfire. It's tough to see, really, unless you look through them. Again, we get yep. back to what's on paper. Yeah. They read the same. Maybe this one has one thing listed different. Or two things, an APO lens and uh, the prism type and uh, extra low dispersion glass, but those things matter. And the, the type that we specified um, to have them manufactured to matters too. Mm. Which some of that's proprietary. We're never going to say Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the Razor UHDs. Can we? Yes, please, because they're new and they're exciting as well. We've discussed the, the Crossfire and the Dimeback HDs. Uh, like Mike said, they are a welcome improvement upon an already 
solid binocular for the price in both those lines. And now on the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, you have a relatively new binocular for us, which is the Razer UHD. Now, this is kind of a different looking binocular for us, Mike. You know, you look at the, um, I guess what some might call, quote, the old Razer HDs, even though they are actually still staying around. Um, we actually have, for example, the 50 millimeter. These are a 12 by 50 Razer HD, regular H- Razer HD, sitting next to the Razer UHD 8 by 42. And we can see that actually even the UHD is a little bit bigger. Um, so, you know, you see that it's a little bit larger. It's got kind of a different curvature to the, uh, not, not dramatically, but just a little bit different shape to it. Um, what's going on with these? What, you know, yeah, you the, the mentioned reason, the Abbey Koenig or whatever yeah, prism. And these have, um, this, the Razor UHD has, um, Abbey Koenig prisms in them, which is a longer prism block. Okay. And that necessitates the binocular to be longer and a little bit larger. Okay. They're going to be a little heavier. They're going to be a little bit longer, but it's a much more efficient prism than, I believe, uh, the HDs have uh, schmidt Pecken prisms in them. Okay. Um, so the different prism type renders a different configuration in terms of size and shape, and it's going to deliver much more efficient light transmission. And in addition, we've not only changed the prism block, but we've changed the glass and the coatings as well. So everything about the UHD is an improvement over the HD. Mm-hmm. And... and Seeing is believing. I mean, I, I used a UHD um, throughout April and May for my birding, which I still do in, during spring migration. <laughs> and, um, and I own a, an HD 842 as well, and I noticed a tremendous difference in optical quality. Much, uh, probably in the 20 years I've worked for our company, the biggest improvement I've seen out of an upgrade uh, in, from one model to another yeah. that we've offered. Just tremendously impressed with it. The Viper HD was up there too. Wasn't yeah, that's it? true. That was a good one too. I, I really like the new Viper HDs as well. But these yeah. ones are pretty sad. Are in definitely. I don't even know if you would say arguably the best bino we've ever made. I think it is the best binocular we've ever made. Yeah, it is. And um, so let's talk about configurations on this one too. I want to discuss this. Um, excellent binocular. You can get an eight by forty two, a ten by forty two. Some of the higher magnification ones are a little bit of a um, uh, a little bit different than I guess the the regular Razor HD. I can't think of the proper term, but we've we've diverted from that uh, scheme with regular Razor HDs: eight by forty-two, ten by forty-two, twelve by fifty, ten by fifty. Okay, right. Boom. Yep. These ones have a. They is there a ten by fifty? There's not a ten by fifty. It's so just yeah. a ten by forty-two, 10 but by then 42, it goes to twelve fifty, and yep. then. 18, 18 by 56. Correct. Can can you guys explain that then? How that how that work out? Well, Mike, I mean, you might know better than I do. I mean, I'm just gonna. Well, originally, um, I'm not sure that we were gonna even have an eight by 42, but I pushed for it um, so that we could have a lower magnification option. I th- I thought it 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 more rounded out the series to have that option. Yeah. Um, again. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact decision was why not to have a 10 by 42. Uh, I'm sorry, a 10 by 50, but um, I think the jump from an 842 to a 10 by 42 is, is an important one. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to necessarily not have a 10 option that, that's you know not going to be the same size as the 8 by 42. We haven't left anybody out in the cold by having a 42 millimeter binocular in an 8 power and a 42 millimeter binocular in a 10 power. You're going to have some people who might not want a larger binocular that still want 10 power and might want 8 power. Mm-hmm. But then do we really want a 10 by 50? If we're, we're kind of saying here, and think about twilight factor here, well, let's just not do the 10 by 50 and do the 12 by 50. It's going to have a larger twilight factor, so it's going to give you that contrast detection in low light. And maybe there's a little bit too much overlap between a 1050 and a 10 by 42. Mark's point. Uh, even though I, I said you're still going to get the resolution gain, not noticing that much difference between a 1042 and a 1050. 
So I think that might be part of the thinking why we don't have a 1050 and we jump right to a, a 1250. And you're kind of you're kind of making up for what somebody might gain by going to a 10 by 50 in just the fact that the optical system is so well designed. Correct. Correct. So you know where somebody might say with a mid level optical system or an entry level optical system, I could use that larger objective size to help me out with a few things like twilight factor. Um, the uh, thing that you mentioned that was a cool word um, that makes it... Resolution. Thank you. Uh, nobody said it, actually. I just came up with it, but thank you. Uh, resolution <laughs> and uh, stuff. Losing my train of thought here. Uh, but in this you know, really high-end level class binocular, maybe not as much of a factor having that 1050. Maybe a little more crossover, a little more overlap between yeah. a 1042 and a 1050. I think a 10 by 50 would only offer a little bit better resolution. But given the high quality of the, of the glass in the 1042, it might it might be closer to a wash, as, mm -hmm. as Mark said. And the 12 by 50, you've seen that one out a lot now in with the Western hunters and stuff, um, people carrying around 12 by 50s. Yep. And despite the fact that, you know, for certain people, 1250 is a little bit difficult to handhold, they're doing it. And I think that the reason being is because you can take a 1250 to the field, carry it, handhold it pretty good, use a rock, use, you know, sit down and use your knees as a brace, use your bone structure as a brace, use a tree, whatever. And then use your tripod as well, and they make a great tripod binocular. Yep. So they kind of are this hybrid configuration. I mean, I've found them to be a, a really great do-all, you know, for open landscape western hunts. I mean, just to all the points that you just made, Jim. I mean, you can still handhold a 12-power binocular. Is it going to maybe be as steady as, as a 10 for, or appear to be as steady as a 1042 or an 8x42? Maybe not, but I think if you know some tricks of the trade, you can definitely, you know, get around that. And like you said, it doubles up. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it, it's just, it, it's kind of a workhorse do-all. Yeah. Then you have the 18 by 56. The big dog. The big hoss. We have a Kaibab, actually, that we have in here. We're just just sitting around uh, with binoculars all around us. A Kaibab is also an 18 by 56. Mm -hmm. But this is this is different. This is a different style of binocular, and I don't think it's quite to the level of the Razor UHD 18 by 56. But explain explain that one. Because otherwise, like prior to this time, we've had pretty much where it's like, You've got your regular full size, if you will, binoculars. Mm -hmm. and like your Viper HDs, they go to like twelve by fifty. At one point, they used to go to fifteen by fifty, but that just overlapped a lot mm -hmm. with these full size outliers, like the Kaibab or the Vulture. And yep. now we're bringing it into the Razor UHD. So it's kind of we wanted to have that ultimate level tripod specific, not even hand holding this one. Although, unless you're Remy Warren, who apparently hand holds them like a boss. I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Um, tripod bino just like the so, ultimate one i mean if you look at the history of the kaibab right it started off as a 15 by 56 with a 20 also right or was well, it only and 15 then a couple years down the road we added the 20 so we kind of had those running congruently we were we offered a 15 by 56 and a 20 by 56 i used both pretty darn extensively uh really liked both of them but with some of the things that we've talked about with that decreased exit pupil, you know, all things being equal as you go up in magnification. Um, the low light performance on the 20s was just, it didn't really compete with the 15s. I think we found a really awesome middle ground, though, with that 18 by 56. It seems to kind of blend the best qualities of both those binos, you know, into what is now the Kaibab. 18 by 56. Definitely uh, a, a binocular that's purpose-built for tripod glassing. Now, of course, we've introduced uh, this Razor UHD series. And just to, just to piggyback on what Mike said, I got the opportunity to use those binos uh, predominantly, the 10 by 42s, used the 18 by 56s uh, a little bit on, on an Idaho bear hunt this year. But the uh, when you look through these things, and, and I, I, I do suggest anybody, if you get an opportunity, take a look through these things because they, I, I always I always say, I sit in my vortex chair, they are stunning. Like, it is mind-blowing when you look through these things. I, I've loved and used the original, or I guess the latest iteration of the Razor HDs a ton. Um, like Mike said, and, and I love them. And they're a phenomenal binocular. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a difference. I mean, these things are stunning. I mean, just the... the uh, the resolution, the color fidelity, um, 
it's just it, they're impressive. Yeah, you know how we often say there's diminishing returns on your dollar as you go up in price for optics. Right. I think I think the upgrade uh, between the HD and the UHD is one of the most contradictory notions of that. That you're really getting a lot more for. Yeah, the that's extra what, money in this case, which is difficult to it's do. It's not a little get, jump. Yeah, it it's is. not a little jump in optical quality. It's a pretty big jump. It is. Yeah, it's it's like. I know, it's like every time I get used to telling customers, you know, like, oh, it's this really simple rule you follow. You know, it's like generally the more you spend, the better you're going to get, but it's it's harder to keep eking out more exactly. and more quality once you get to that high of a level. So you're going to spend more money, but you're not going to see as huge of a jump up as you did maybe in the lower to mid levels. And then all of a sudden we come out with this and I'm like, well, crap, now yeah. I got to come up with a new thing to tell yeah, people. Thanks <laughs> because debunking now my it's whole like program. you go up, you know, the $500, which isn't chump change, but for somebody who's looking for an alpha class banana, Binocular, you go up that from the Razor HD to the UHD, and it's like, whoa, that was that was a jump. If you can scrape it together, it's worth it. And if you can't, you still got a hell of a bino. That's the, tag, that's the tagline. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically uh, going to dead or eat ramen for the, the UHDs. Yep. Um, but even, even still, for what they're competing with, though, when well, you consider what they're competing with, still even even up to double the price. Yep. As you guys both know, um, when I worked for Eagle Optics, we sold our competitors' brands, some of the European brands, and I'm tickled having shown this binocular to a few showroom guests now um, uh, at our at our Barneveld location, um, where people hold the binocular up to the, the UHD up to their eyes, and the first thing they, they say is "Wow." Yep, mm-hmm. which is often what I would hear when. Eagle Optics customers would would look through the European Alpha class binoculars, so I, it just I'm really grateful to hear customers look through a Vortex binocular and have the first thing they say is just wow. Mm. Now, I've heard that on the HDs before too here and you there. You even hear it sometimes on yeah. like the most entry level thing that you the have. The Viper but... too, yeah, yeah. But um, people that I've shown the UHD to so far have just been blown away by its optical quality yeah their initial impression is just wow it's astounding yeah yeah Get, getting back to Ooh. the 18s though and kind of where those fit in the line i think if if you kind of we talk about the difference between you know like an 8 and a 10 or a 10 and a 12 and i feel like you know like a 12 it's almost like the same thing with that bracket between a 12 and a 15 i think if you didn't have a 12 then maybe you have that 15 but with the 12 that 18 just makes a lot of sense. You kind of almost have two hybrids yeah. up there. You have an 8x42 and a 10x42. Those are going to be your workhorses. Those are the most popular configuration. I are, Well, probably the 10x42 is definitely the most popular well, configuration of all. And, and think of the design of the UHD in the context of something I said earlier, that one way to improve what you see is by improving the glass quality. Mm-hmm. Okay, You don't necessarily need more magnification. Okay, so there could be some, what some may see as gaps in our lineup aren't really gaps at all, but the, because we've improved the, improved the glass so well, some of these uh, configurations just aren't necessary. True. Right. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. I'm going to toss good way to out, put it. I'm going to toss out, and you can, you can feel free to follow it up if you want to start bringing in your last call. I'm going to toss out my last call, though, real fast here now, because I don't want to forget it. That's Hit the me. thing. Uh, Hit is, us, excuse me. Is that binoculars... I, I was kind of alluding to this, but as we talked about it more, I've realized I, I've kind of like been able to put it into words how they can be very simple and they can be extraordinary comp- or extraordinarily complex. And I think a lot of like the internet culture of buying things online and not seeing them in person or whatever is probably kind of fuel to this fire in that. When you can't see through a binocular in person, you start having to rely on very, very complicated things, and you start having to almost understand what the engineer who designed the binocular understood. And you start talking about the prism design, the type of prism, the type of glass, the the type of optical system, the type of eyepiece and ocular assembly and... You know, you start thinking about Twilight Factor and you're literally doing calculations to get exit pupils and, you know, you're doing all these different things to try and make up what your eye will see, but you can never actually know until your eye just sees it. And then once you're able to actually get these things in person, that's the part where, what I was kind of getting at at first, where it's like, then it actually becomes more simple. And you have the factor uh, in play 
like we mentioned where, you know, if you're at a dealer and you're looking at things under bright fluorescent lights and you're not looking very far or you take it outside and it's just a nice bright bluebird day, you know, then still maybe it's going to be difficult because you're not putting the binoculars to the extremes that would then really show the differences. But even still, at least you're seeing it with your own two eyes. And that's where it just starts to become, which one looks better? Because yep. at the end of the day, these are observation optics. You know, you have you have subtle differences like, you know, the Viper HDs, they have a, uh, I think the Viper HDs have a polycarbonate chassis, and the Razor HDs have a magnesium chassis. You look at those things that are like a form factor thing where the Razor HDs you would surmise to then just be, you know, that much more durable while still maintaining a light weight. But, you know, it's kind of, it, tons of people have been hunting and using and abusing polycarbonate chassis binoculars for a long time. The technology has advanced so much. I'm not so much worried about that. Where it's like, really what it comes down to is just how good do they look? How yep. well do they make me see stuff far away? You've boiled it down, Jim. It's simple and it's really hard. <laughs> simple and it's really hard. Have you ever bought a car without test driving it? <sighs> they do that now, though, too. You just really, you just, yeah. You just buy go on. You just bought. I had the cart, which I couldn't do. The, you know, it's but like if if you did that, why would you do that? Because oh, you're you looking for a project, right? You're looking for a project if you do that. I have done it actually, yeah. but I was looking for a project. <laughs> yeah. But I do think optics, um, by reputation, will sell themselves too. From some person's buddy buys one. He has an op- opportunity to look through it, and then he tells his friend, hey, so-and-so has one of these. Have you looked through that yet? They kind of eventually sell themselves, too. Mm-hmm. Once they get a reputation, you know, that brand, yep. that model. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll just, I guess with my last call, I'll just piggyback on what you said, Jim. And, and I'd say if, if a person's looking to buy a binocular, and you know maybe they're debating between uh, brands or configurations, if you can carve out the time... And, and find yourself a, a sales associate that'll take the time to work with you, go to that retailer at those slightly more critical times, you know, probably late in the day, and, uh, and see if you can't get like models on a tripod and go back and forth and pick some subjects to, to look at mm-hmm. and, and really make that comparison during those times where you are more likely to see the differences between those binoculars. Mm-hmm. And the further you can away you can look at something, the better comparison you're going to get. Um, just because you're in an enclosed store, don't necessarily think you've got to focus on a countertop or something. You know, look around you and see how far, what is the furthest thing inside the store I can actually, that's the distance you should be looking at if you can't go outside and, and look through right. them. Yeah. I hate shopping for binoculars. It's awesome. That's what I'm thinking right now. It's like, <laughs> I, it's like you both love it and you hate it because it's like, you can so great and complex. Which is why I have to work here to be close to the source. Exactly. If you have, if if you ever just wonder things, just call and ask for Mike McDowell. He'll let you know. He will. Um, Mike, did we miss anything? Slash, would you uh, would you do us the honor of of closing closing us out with a uh, with an awesome thought? An on, awesome thought. It can be mildly related or it can be about hmm. Star Wars. Your choice. Gosh. <laughs> I've never really done a podcast. So. Ex- extra points for okay. relating Star Wars to optics. Somehow, optics. yeah. Well, well, Luke Skywalker first uh, notices Princess Leia's ship under attack through the use of an optic. Oh. I don't think it's a binocular. I think it's a monoscopic electronic device. But um, that scene was actually cut out of the, the final movie. But if you go on YouTube, you can find it. I was going to say, how do you know about it? Yeah, wait, yeah. It's, it, it's in the book, okay? I read the book before I saw the movie, the original 1977 Star Wars movie. Was that a mistake for you? Did it ruin the movie or did it? No, I was a total Star Wars fanatic. Okay. I was absolutely You're in. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you can actually find uh, a bunch of cut scenes, including that one, um, on YouTube. Amazing. Yeah. But no, I I, uh, I don't know that I have any any uh, profound advice. I think Mark's advice: go to a retailer, uh, spend some hands on, some eyes through time looking through different models, and uh, do your own side by side comparisons. Um, and another thing is, uh, if you can't do that, something at least our old retail entity did is we allowed our customers to buy two or three different models so that they could do their own 
side-by-side -side comparisons and return the ones that they didn't want, keep the one that they thought worked the best. I'm not sure mm. what other retailers might do that today, Yeah, but right. we, we did that. And uh, so I think that's a, a, a kind thing to do if there are retailers out there who will, who will do that for their customers. But uh, the more opportunity you have, friends who have different optics. Uh, one other point that I'll make is, is if you're really in a quandary, um, if you call Vortex and you can get some, someone like myself or maybe Ryan who's looked through a lot of glass, if you can even name one binocular you've looked through, I have a, sure. I have a reference point from that perspective yeah, that's where true. I might steer you in a recommendation. That's true. If you've never looked through anything, we have no commonality to say that this thing is this much better than that. Or, yeah. You know, but if you've looked through just one, even a competitor's brand, Chances are I've looked through it. Hmm. What's the most obscure binocular you own? I have... It doesn't have to be Vortex. I don't even know the name of it, but um, a relative gave me an antique binocular that's on my fireplace mantle. It's just an old Galilean binocular from maybe, I don't know, the eight, it might even be an antique uh, of some worth. I don't even know. I've never bothered to check it out. I would have to say, though, um, my most valued optic is my grandfather's telescope. Which is a nice little brand's. Uh, 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 it's a brass collapsible uh, telescope. Oh, cool! That um, I think you know that sits on my shelf in my bedroom, and I've got it on display. But if you ever come to my my place, which I'm never going to reveal the address for, um, I've got a lot of optics on display. I was just going to say, if the FBI ever raided Mike's place, they'd be like, "What is this guy doing?" <laughs> <laughs> we got a voyeur. <laughs> yep. All right. Well. Hopefully, I don't know if we made it more complicated or less complicated. Maybe at the end there we made it less complicated could, to buy binoculars. Yeah. Uh, but here, here, here's the simplification. If you're a birder, think 8x42. If you're a hunter, 1042, 1050, 1250. It's really that simple. Smaller binoculars, like compacts, very specific. Hiker who's thinking about weight, backpacker, back, backpack across Europe, a kayaker who wants something small around their neck, compact binocular. Large format binoculars, astronomer or someone who wants to tripod mount a large format binocular to look at vast distances. It's really almost that simple. Thanks for clearing that up. Mike. Thanks, everybody. All right. We'll see you next time. Happy hunting and shooting. Bye. Bye. Bye now. All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.